<laughs> the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Um, the great, great push um, that uh, powered the civil rights movement in the uh, from 60 on. Uh, people think of it as a uh, push for desegregation and education, but what the young people in the South were doing was pushing for voting rights. And uh, that was a, a very powerful, very bloody, very contested fight. And uh, when that law was enacted um, in 1965, when the president uh, went President Johnson went to the well of the House and introduced it and finished his speech by shouting at the House, we shall overcome. The country was electrified. And um, there has ever since been a very consistent um, and healthy push among African Americans to A, to get people involved in voting, and B, to get good people to run for office. So, um, the whole time he was president. I started um, as, I guess I started as uh, assistant to the administrator of AID. That's where I was working in the Kennedy administration. Um, but um, six months after Johnson became president, a new civil rights agency was created by the Civil Rights Act of 1964. It was called the Community Relations Service. So I switched from AID to that service. When Johnson, in a, um, about uh, a year later, uh, President Johnson made me head of the service. And uh, so for three years, I was a presidential appointee working for him. Uh, well, that was uh, a time, I can't tell you very clearly, because that was at a time when I was a social worker in Cleveland, Ohio. But it was a mild, um, Voting Rights Act, it created, as I recall, the um, Civil Rights Commission, the United States Civil Rights Commission. Um, it was the first, the, but the significance wasn't what it did, it was that Johnson got it done. He was the um, majority leader of the United States Senate. Um, and in those days, filibusters were used almost primarily to stop civil rights uh, legislation. And um, so for years, there had been efforts to get some kind of civil rights bill through the Congress of the United States, and it could never happen. It was through Johnson's um, enormous effectiveness as a, um, and, and his, his, his great ability to push people to do what he wanted and to compromise. So in the end, when the, I, I do recall that, uh, that uh, compromises were made at the end in order to get it through. And a lot of people thought that Johnson was a bad fellow because he made the compromises in order to achieve the legislation. But the fact is, he did achieve the legislation, and people who worked close in with him, like my Uncle Roy, who was head of the uh, NAACP, Joe Rao, a Washington lawyer deeply involved in civil rights, and Clarence Mitchell, the lobbyist for the NAACP, got an idea about Johnson's attitude on civil rights from that legislation. I have not heard about Greene County, but I am aware generally that uh, Alabama has a particularly bad record in attempting to um, roll back the voting rights of black people. Um, the current Senator uh, Sessions, uh, when he was a U.S. attorney, uh, was extraordinarily vigorous in uh, bringing um, prosecutions uh, or making accusations against uh, black voting rights um, officials and volunteers uh, alleging uh, and alleging voter fraud, alleging uh, fraud in um, use of absentee ballots, the same kind of thing that she's talking about in Greene County. And uh, that, has a, that has a quite a firm and vigorous history uh, in uh, Alabama, unfortunately. Well, it did a number of things. Um, it gave uh, the federal government uh, more enforcement authority to uh, desegregate uh, schools in the South. Um, it, did, it righted a wrong that drove black people crazy, and that is that federal funds, taxpayers' dollars, would go to support segregated institutions all over the country. It outlawed that. In, uh, 
Title VI. Um, it uh, it uh, created the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission um, in Title VII, um, providing people with protections against job discrimination. Uh, it created, uh, it created, as I said, the Community Relations Service, which was designed to uh, mediate uh, racial problems in uh, in uh, cities around the country. It was a that was a particular dream of Johnson's. He had tried to get it into the. 57 Civil Rights Act and had failed, and so he got it into the 64 Act, um, and it provided uh, it provided remedies for blacks who were discriminated against in public places. So it was just it just opened the world in ways that uh, had been closed to us before. Oh, I don't think that there's any doubt, but that um, he was a man who was profoundly committed to changing this country. Um, he understood um, deep in his soul uh, how unfair the country had been, uh, not only to blacks, but to Mexican-Americans, whom he had known in Texas. And he knew it not simply in terms of pure civil rights, he knew it in terms of poverty as well. He was committed on both counts. Um, he cared deeply. Um, he believed that that would be his legacy. He said over and over and over again, um, we're going to finish here what Lincoln began. Um, now he did use he did use uh, uh, salt and peppered uh, his talk with uh, racial slurs. I mean that's who he was. That's how he grew up. But um, I think that uh, most of us who lived through the Johnson years believe that uh, Johnson was the best president on civil rights we ever had, and his his relationships with. Um, black leaders uh, until both the war and the urban unrest uh, really tore him apart uh, was really very good. You could, you could watch him with these people and, and, and they were people he liked, people he, he had empathy with, people he listened to. I remember I was in the cabinet room one day and he was, uh, and this is kind of toward the end when he was getting pretty sour. And he was uh, telling the uh, civil rights leaders uh, about the uh, voting, uh, the Housing Act, Fair Housing Act of 68 that he was going to propose. And at some point, he said something about, well, now, you know, you, you people just have to be patient. You have to be patient. Well, that's something that black people did not want to hear. And Clarence Mitchell, who was the uh, Washington bureau chief of the NAACP, yes, that's Clarence on the right with his back to the camera. Clarence said, now, wait a minute, Mr. President, just wait a minute. He said, uh, black people have been patient for all these years. White people have always been telling us to be patient. We are citizens of this country. We, and Clarence got tears in his eyes. And, but he wouldn't stop. And the president looked at him and said, okay, Clarence, okay, I got it, Clarence, I understand. Okay, Clarence, right, all right, okay, I got it. I, I mean, it, there was a wonderful human exchange in that. I, first of all, I don't think I said it was entirely due to the Voting Rights Act. I think that's the, that was the big bang. Uh, but of course there's been a change. I mean, if uh, the uh, United States of uh, 1960 um, has really disappeared, and uh, we do have an entirely different country than uh, than uh, we did then. Uh, we can, uh, uh, whether it's in terms of traveling through the country and feeling safe, or whether it's uh, it's cross race friendships, or whether it's uh, uh, the increase in intermarriage, or the willingness of of white people to vote for blacks. Of course, the country has changed, and and there is a diminution of racism. There still is an extraordinary amount of racism in this country, and I don't think anybody should uh, fool herself or himself about that. But I would also say, Brian and I were talking when I first came in, Brian pointed out that a uh, roll call, I think, has a story this morning uh, which indicates that only nine blacks have been nominated for the Senate in the United States in this century. Well, what does that mean? What it means is that the state parties do not believe that black people can win statewide elections. State parties do believe that you can win uh, mayor to be mayor in Detroit, but they don't believe that um, blacks can win statewide in the state of Michigan and in most states in this country. So that um, the idea that, uh, that uh, racism has entirely disappeared from our, our politics is, uh, is uh, not true.
Thank you. That's because uh, I went to the University of Michigan and spent a long time living in Grand Rapids, and my <laughs> mother still lives there. Well, I think uh, the caller has, a, uh, has asked a very profound question. People who live in a culture in which um, there's an awful lot of uh, hostility toward them uh, tend to internalize to one degree or another um, the negative attitudes that they receive from um, uh, outside and they then uh, get rid of those attitudes by attacking other members of their own race. Now. Uh, people get upset, well, white people, some white people get upset when you hear people talk about black pride, Hispanic pride, Indian pride, but the fact is that those movements to make people uh, proud of who they are um, have the effect, uh, I believe, of decreasing that kind of hostility because people feel good about themselves. Um, they begin to feel uh, more positive about other people of their own race. Um, but I also think the, the deprivation that, uh, that uh, you find on Indian reservations in this country um, is just shattering and it's shameful to this country that somehow we have not figured out uh, how to make the uh, wealth of uh, the nation turn it into opportunity for, for uh, young um, kids born on reservations, and uh, that's a huge problem. No, uh, the, the idea was around in bits and pieces, and it was kind of inchoate at the time. Um, we had really bigger, uh, tougher, uglier problems in, in 64. Just when the Civil Rights Act um, was signed in 64, um, New York, Brooklyn, Patterson, Rochester, all erupted. And from then through the time when Dr. King was killed in 68, um, we had the cities. Um, we had, we still didn't have Voting Rights Act uh, in 64. Um, we were still figuring out how to desegregate uh, all the places that the law said should be desegregated. And it was only after people began to understand that if you, if you stopped um, doing bad things, after 300 years of having bad things been, be done to black people, but you didn't do good things, the blacks would still be way back here, and the whites would be here, and the country would still be unfair. And you would find that people would still found, find ways to discriminate, particularly in employment and other places. And, so, and they lied. So you start to say, well, at least they have to count. <laughs> they, they have to, and they have to try to integrate these places. And that's how affirmative action started. And it started uh, in government contracting. That is, if you were going to do a job for the U.S. government and get paid by tax dollars, that Americans of all race, creeds, and colors paid for, then you ought to have, try to have a workforce that reflects what America looks like. And that's when affirmative action really took hold. It was in the, in the Labor Department. Um, at first it was good, but it was, King was always a problem for the uh, Democrats. Uh, first, uh, first uh, the uh, Kennedys and then Johnson because those demonstrations in the South really tested the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party was a solid South and the Southern um, members of the legislature and the Congress, uh, I mean, and uh, the Senate would really put a lot of pressure on the White House about these demonstrations. Stop them. These guys are your friend. You stop them. And uh, so that was a problem. But and then there was, there was Hoover always whispering in uh, Johnson's ear both that, uh, that King was a communist and that uh, he had this uh, wild sex life. So that um, you, but, but Johnson did support the things that, uh, that uh, King tried to do. Uh, he surely was, uh, once he understood it, he was supportive of uh, Selma in, 
in 65 and sent troops down to protect the marchers. Uh, but it was what broke it with uh, Johnson and King was uh, Vietnam. Um, Johnson could not get out of Vietnam. The caller who asked about Vietnam was, was, was right. Those of us who worked for Johnson were driven nuts because we supported him wholeheartedly on, on race, and yet we, as a lot of us hated the war. Uh, and um, uh, Johnson got furious at King. Um, and, uh, and ultimately got furious at the Civil Rights Movement. Um, I remember I was the, the federal official who was sent down to um, be the liaison with the King family during King's funeral. And one of the things I found out very quickly is that there were way too many people for the logistics of the community to take care of. So I called the White House and said, look, we need uh, the, the White House approval to let the Georgia National Guard put, uh, use their tents and blankets to take care of a lot of these people. So I talked to Joe Califano, who was his special assistant for domestic affairs. And Joe said, you really need him, Roger. I said, sure, Joe, we really need him you know, badly. We need the president's approval. And Joe thought for a minute and he said, Okay, Roger, I'll give the approval, but don't tell the president. Well, you have to raise that with the people of North Carolina. Um, I never heard uh, your story, but I was appalled to read the other day that uh, when uh, Carol Mosley Braun was in the Senate and had thwarted him on uh, the Confederate flag for the, for the ladies of the Confederacy, they found themselves in an elevator together, and he started singing Dixie and commented to somebody, I'm going to tell keep on singing Dixie till she cries. Well, I uh, surely um, believe that uh, Jewish people have uh, contributed in a very, very powerful and significant way to the civil rights movement. I don't see the civil rights movement, however, as my movement uh, or black people's movement. Uh, I think it is an American movement to redeem the promise of America for everyone. And I think that uh, the fact that we have uh, President Johnson helped us and others have helped us get uh, civil rights for black people and Hispanics, women, it makes America a much better place. Now, having said that, I will say that some of the people who have contributed most, some of the white people who have contributed most, most significantly, most generously, most courageously, uh, have been Jewish people. There's just no question about it. And. Uh, but not all Jewish people have uh, done that. Some Jewish people have uh, been on the other side. But proportionately and in terms of, of ingenuity and in terms of generosity and in terms of stick to I just mentioned one earlier, Joe Rao, who was a, just a civil rights hero. Um, but there are many, 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 many others. So the Jewish contribution to the civil rights cause has been enormous. No, I can't tell you exactly the voting, but I can tell you that the uh, that um, President Kennedy um, initiated the bill, uh, and it was uh, uh, percolating, uh, uh, had been begun to percolate into the Congress when he was uh, killed. President Johnson uh, took it up uh, and pushed it with great passion and fervor and build it as a memorial to President Kennedy. He used the, the, the death of President Kennedy and people's strong feelings about it to move that bill through the Congress. So it was initiated by the Democratic administration and pushed powerfully by the Democratic administration. And its strongest, staunchest allies were liberal Democrats from the North. However, there were a number of very stellar Republicans as well. Uh, moderates like uh, Hugh Scott, a uh, senator from uh, Pennsylvania, uh, um, McCullough, uh, Bill McCullough of, uh, of uh, Ohio in the House, and many others. And Everett McKinley Dirksen, the, the, the leader of uh, the Republicans, who said, um, this is an idea whose time has come, and he turned it. And uh, so, and Bill Nolan from California. So there were there were Republicans. It passed with bipartisan support. So the Republicans, when they claim some credit for it, are uh, do have uh, a justification. <laughs> you certainly assume right, right. And and the, 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 you know you can you, 
expect Eastland and Talmadge and people like that. The, the tragedy was, uh, was uh, Fulbright, who was, uh, in all other respects, a, a, a decent and civilized and honorable um, public servant, but who, because uh, we assume of uh, his views of what his uh, constituency would tolerate, was uh, quite dreadful on civil rights. Uh, well, uh, uh, the, the idea has always been that uh, black people are uh, not smart enough to, I mean, a lot of people think that black people are not smart enough to be around white people in schools. Um, I think that uh, probably the education level in Alabama today is a lot better than the education was uh, when you were there, and I think it's probably a lot better for both blacks and whites, but uh, like every place in the country, it needs, uh, it needs improvement. Oh, I think I think I check. I think I have to say they're two a very unlikely pair because they sure despised each other. Uh, first Johnson and then Bob Kennedy. Um, oh, not not the ever part. Uh, we t we we demonstrate against Bob when he was uh, um, uh, Attorney General, and that included some of us who were in the government because uh, the. Uh, Justice Department was running the civil rights program, and it was uh, virtually lily white at the top, and it was, we thought, patronizing and condescending. President Johnson was a very complex man. I mentioned that he used the word a lot. He almost slipped and used it uh, in my presence once and was quite embarrassed. Um, but that's how he was raised. But it did not bespeak um, racial animus. I have see, I've just seen him around too many black people to have any lingering belief that there was that there was a uh, reservation he Johnson appointed first black to the Federal of the Reserve Board he pr pr appointed the first black uh, member of his cabinet Bob Weaver Andy Andrew Brimmer um, and uh, uh, there was just no hey appointed Cliff Alexander is uh, chairman of the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission <laughs> right, Thurgood, first black on the Supreme Court of the United States. I mean, he really wanted to change the country. He felt it, it was in his gut, in his heart. Now, he grew up in a place where they used the word nigger, and, and he used it. That's no question. And in a political situation where he wanted something from somebody, he would do anything to get what he wanted. Well, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's the cleaned up way. <laughs> that's, that's the uptown way of, of no, because the word negro has gone a long way. I still hear nigger, obviously. Uh, Albert Gore Sr. may have voted against the Civil Rights Act. He was also uh, a he was also one of the three Southern senators who would not sign the Southern Manifesto. The other two were Estes Kefauver and Lyndon Johnson. Um, it, that he may have voted against the Civil Rights Act. I don't know, but he was uh, he was a man of uh, he was a very fine senator. Well, we disagree, and we don't have time for me to have that argument, which, uh, and I'm not here for that, but I want to tell you the last time I saw Johnson. Um, he and I did not speak in the last few years, in the last year or so, because um, he was so angry at the black leadership that he kind of pushed down the Kerner report when it came out. And I was, I was terribly upset about the war, and so we just didn't have anything to do with each other. And, but I still loved what he had done in civil rights. Many years later, about summer of 72, I was in New York and somebody dragged me to a party that I didn't want to go to, but only, and I wasn't going to go until the person said, Lyndon Johnson is there, and I couldn't, I couldn't keep away. And this was only a few months before he died. And I walked in and he, his hair was long and it was all white. And uh, he was telling a story when I walked in and the hostess brought me over to him. Well, he finished his story and he grabbed me and he hugged me and he started telling all these famous people, uh, David Frost and Barbara Walters and uh, Walter Cron Cronkite, what a great man I was and how I had saved the country and all this. And he was hugging me and as you know, he's really big. And I was smoking a cigarette, I smoked at the time and I had to hold it behind my shoulder so I wouldn't burn him. And he told this extravagance about me which was all sweet but not right. When, I, when he finished then we went over in a corner and we started talking he asked me what I was doing and I told him I was in journalism and I said now what are you doing Mr. President and he said well I'm just I don't like what things are going I don't like what Nixon is doing on civil rights and I just am troubled I said well why don't you say something and he said well he said do you think anybody would listen to you I said of course people would listen to you I said you got the second most powerful voice in this country today and you can still do it 
And he looked, well, he said, I'd have to talk to somebody about it, Roger. Who would I talk to? I said, talk to my Uncle Roy. You guys know each other. You're the same generation. You like each other. You trust each other. That's a good idea. He said, That's a good idea. And so then we said a few other things, and we parted. And in a few minutes, I decided or I was going to leave the party and feel like it. And he was way across the room. There were a lot of people. He was leaning on a piano. As I was walking out the door, I waved at him, and he smiled, and he just wiggled his fingers at me. It was the last time I ever saw him. Two weeks later, my uncle called me and said, guess who I heard from? I said, who? Oh. He said, Lyndon Johnson. He's invited me down to uh, the ranch. And I said, oh, well, that's nice. I didn't say anything. And so my uncle later told me that he's thinking about, that Johnson was thinking about making a speech, and uh, he and Johnson had talked over some ideas. Well, a few months later, the, at the dedication of the LBJ Library, Johnson got up, and he had this terrible heart problem. As Johnson was deeply worried about him. He was popping nitroglycerin pills. But he got up, and he made this extraordinary civil rights speech. And it was the last speech of his life. Um, everybody was galvanized, and uh, that's the story.